Welcome to the Upstream Podcast. I'm your host, Ty Wise. I'm here with my boy, Grant Fish. And today, not only are we receiving a lesson, but I'm going to be happily joined by a good buddy of mine, Ryan Gardner. What's up, man? How are you doing? I'm really good. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. I've been talking about this for a minute, and I'm glad that it's actually coming to fruition. So let's just get right into it. Uh, you have four wine glasses in front of you. I do. And I'm so eager to see what you brought. Well, uh, first of all, again, thank you for having me. Uh, I don't know about a lesson as much as I'm going to pour some wine. I feel like when when people get together, it's always better with wine. Uh, 100%. So I agree. That's kind of that. where I came from on it. We can we can dive into some of the particulars. Too, yeah. yeah. Ooh, um, there it is. What are, what are we starting with? So we are starting with a wine varietal. Uh, from a region in northeastern Italy. It is known as Suave, which like, is made with like the Rico? great Garganaga. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, super good for this warm weather that we're in right now. I mean, it, it's pretty oppressively hot it's out there. It's only 115 there. degrees. Yeah. It's not the worst summer <laughs> I've lived through in Arizona, month I'll tell you that. Ever, they keep yeah. saying. I feel like they say Phoenix. that every year. Yeah. I don't know, dude. Like every year, it's like, this is the hottest day on record. Sure. Are we ever going to not have the hottest day on record? Oh, goodness. Oh, you're so welcome. So, All right. uh, cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. To your venture uh, in front of the microphone. To Suave. To my boy Rico. Indeed. Hmm. Oh, yeah. That's nice. Italy knows how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You're Def a huge fan of Italian wines. Big fan of Italian wines. I think one of the reasons why I am is because they're food wines. They're built for and around food. They Isn't there a huge wine. difference between, uh, I guess, old world and new world, but this would be considered old world and mm -hmm. old world yeah. favors wine pairings with food. As it's, opposed to new world, it's like, let's get crazy. It, a little bit. So, um, yeah, to, to go back a couple of steps... Uh, and demystify old world, new world. Uh, old world is Europe, right? Anything new, and everything. New world, everywhere else. Heard that. Yeah, basically. That makes it easy. I know. That's kind of... Does that oversimplify if, if, it? If someone sitting across from me doing a podcast was going to ask a question about how I go about the wine, mm -hmm. it's to basically try to make it as user-friendly as humanly possible. Because it's such a big subject. I feel like anyone that wants to talk wine, they have this stigma where it's like, you have to have pinky raised, you right. have to be in a suit, and that's not what we're doing. No. Nah. Hey, man, some of the best wine I've ever had, I've been on the tailgate of a truck. There it is. Or I've had my toes in the sand <laughs> drinking it out of a solo cup. Like, or I've been right. at a, a podcast. Concert, you know what I mean? Like, or a podcast. Or yeah. a podcast. Exactly. Amen. Cheers. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what that's all about. But yeah. So what sparked your interest in wine other than it's a damn good beverage and it gets totally. you to a fun place? Totally. Uh, I, I think it came from uh, hospitality. Mm -hmm. It just came out of a, a desire to look for a good time, have a good time, show people a good time, um, and really explore that. And, of course, I started drinking when I was very young. And above you legal of age, shift, of course. What's that? Above legal age, of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, you know, you kind of shift from the big three, Coors Light, Miller Light, and Bud Light, <laughs> and it, someone hands you a glass of wine, and you're like, what's this? Amazing. Um, and, I love this grape juice. Yeah. And after a while, it just started to steadily be around more. And as I kept going through my career as a server and um an event server and a bartender uh just kept learning more about it and got more and more charmed by it and and after i've been studying like how it's actually made and um how it really is when did you start studying how it was made uh i mean in earnest probably about eight years ago okay and and you know just in the last four or five years really got into how f it's basically farmers, mm -hmm. farmers who who grow a crop and really listen to what 
the the farm is telling them, what the fruit is telling them. What does and, that mean? And how it, That's interesting. I love that. Yeah. So, okay. So, you mentioned earlier that Old World was more built around um, food wine. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times this was because families that own farmland would have grapevines on their farmland and they would make wine out of it and then they'd go slaughter one of their pigs and make a pork dish with it and it would all end up on the same dining room table. Obviously, modern techniques and machinery and uh, industry comes along and all of a sudden people start adding more sugar and more preservatives and weird chemical stuff. Um, and of and course, so, this is oversimplifying the uh, process, yeah, of course. For sure. But um, and, you know, after a while, it turned into something where saying the words biodynamic or organic became something special. But that's literally how wine has been made for over 9,000 years. Mm-hmm. It's always been organic. We just started making it weird. And so people are. What do you mean? Thankfully, making it weird with those odd chemicals and pesticides. That, do you think that, that happened when it? America started mass producing? Yeah. Okay. I, I think when it started to become like more of a mass produced thing, it it you know, it, they looked at it and said we have to take certain steps in order to make an extra buck on it, and you know, hey, capitalism, I suppose. But yeah, but it's bought us at the some end great of the day, wines. Yeah. At the end of the day, w- what we're starting to see in the last. I don't know, 10 years especially, is is people swinging back to an old world style of making wine, even here in the States and in new world places. Like you said before, new world is a little more rock and roll. Old that. world is a little bit more of a <laughs> symphony orchestra. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, I, I that's the best way that I can put it. Right. You know, old world symphony orchestra, rock new world, world rock and roll. I want a big, loud, I want it to have a higher alcohol content. I don't need it to go with food. I want to be at the Catalina wine mixer with my big alcoholic Catalina glass of sa- wine mixer. <laughs> Savion Blanc. And I want to be uh, trying to lug my nut through my, through my afternoon. So um, now we're starting to sp- getting roundabout way back to what you're talking about, about uh, or, or what we were talking about with farmers listening to, to what they're growing and mm-hmm. how that plays through from grape to glass. Wine growers will uh, will basically go and, and taste the fruit as it gets closer to harvest. And some of them have been doing it for so long and their families have been doing it so long. They can literally taste what the wine's going to taste like just from yeah. getting a grape in their That's mouth insane. from their own yeah. vineyard and pulling it apart. Like literally like pulling it apart, tasting the fruit, tasting the skin, tasting the seed tasting a stem and that's how they realize the tannic structure that it's going to have the sugar levels and you go back to their winery they've got a full lab where they're testing ph levels and bricks levels is is what they call the what sugar if they levels. don't like it do they just like scrap it like nope this it, this is not good it usually has to take a lot to say we're scrapping it you know what i mean like just like just like if you're you know, in the middle of a Friday night shift and things are going a little rocky, you don't like look at it because you're three or four hours in your shift and go, I think we're just going to scrap this shift. Like, <laughs> sometimes it, I, do. Not, I, I do that sometimes. You Definitely know, shut the that. lights. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. We're just going to bar the doors, I think. Yeah. Um, Does that where vintages that, that are great mm-hmm. and vintages that are mm-hmm. not that great come so, from? Is that it, you, essentially they still need to run their vineyard yeah and and that's the huge thing these are these are real people that invest lots of money and time and energy and you know blood sweat and tears for real and it's it's not an easy way to go unless unless you are a larger company that it's just like yeah we kind of make wine for fun or it's 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 have a you thing ever worked on a vineyard of, you know that's that's in my line of sight for uh, this coming harvest, actually, I'm talking to a couple people about spending a few weeks uh, to work some some harvest. I have been on a vineyard, uh, worked a little bit with winemakers in their wine uh, in their wine houses. Uh, looking winemakers at- go boots on ground. Oh, they, yeah. they're the they they. I mean, yes, they hire people to do it for them, right? But for the most part, they'll get in the vineyards, they'll pick the grapes, they'll mash the grapes, they'll they'll be there. From start to finish. 
it can it can work a lot of different ways. Usually, the best wines have that winemaker, owner, proprietor in the fields, working with everybody, really overseeing any and every part of the process. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are others that are winemakers alone. I don't grow the fruit, I buy fruit, and then I make wine out of it. Like I let other people farm, and then I go to them and buy their fruit. Now, that goes back to quality level too. Does so that affect sort of, quality? Oh yeah. Okay, so, in what way, positive or negative? Or does it just- It depends on where you buy your fruit. Gotcha. You know what I mean? You go to Fry's, you're kind of like, mm -hmm. okay, I kind of know what I'm gonna get. There might be a few genetically altered apples in there. There <laughs> might be some weirdo things. But, you know, you go to a farmer's market or you go to a, a Sprouts or a whatever. I'm not saying it's always the best, but it, it, it changes the quality level and how you look at it. I was just talking with um, uh, Justin Willett from Tyler Winery, great, great winery out of Santa Barbara in the Santa Rita Hills. And um, he, he kind of talked about, you know, one of the things that made his winery special is that in the beginning he didn't have his own land, but he figured out a contract with um, the, the vineyards that he worked with so that he controlled how they grew it, like what pesticides they weren't using or were using and how they were doing everything. And so his end result wine became better. You, you know? hear a lot about uh, California wineries. You hear a lot about Oregon, you hear a lot about Washington, but Arizona just in these past couple of years is coming up pretty strong. Uh, have you worked with any local Arizona winemakers or do you have any plans to? Uh, I have plans to. Uh, that being said, like you said, it's definitely in that coming up period. We have been making wine here yeah. uh, for a while now, um, mainly with varietals that are a little sturdier and can stand up to the ruggedness mm -hmm. of, of our, our, our terroirs. The Merkin. Um, the Merkin, the that's Merkin. right. The Chupacabra. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and it's a lot of blends. It's a lot of Grenaches and Syrahs. It's a lot of, um, on, on the white wine side, um, Malvasia Bianca, uh, which, is, which is a super spiced, delicious I've white heard wine. that has a lot to do with where we are on the equator line. Yeah. And so, does that represent? Does that does that equate? No pun intended. <laughs> uh, a, a, a similar wine to something that you would get across the globe, just because we're on that same lateral line. Um, it can. There's a I, lot I think of other there's, variables. There's local weather. There's local soils that go into it. Uh, but in general, when like let's say all three of us own a winery or a vineyard, or we're out looking to make a vineyard mm -hmm. and we're going to look at soil type to make sure that it's got all the stuff that we need as far as nutrients go. Um, and you're accounting for runoff and what, and then, uh, we'll also look at what other grapes grow well in those environments. So you would look at like Grenache and Syrah uh, dominantly back in the, in the old world or best known coming from the Rhone Valley, right? Rhone Valley in France, Grenache, Syrah, and Moved, you can grow those out here because if you go to the Rhone Valley, it is very rugged. And uh, uh, fun fact, have you ever heard the term spaghetti western? No. No? Maybe no. in passing. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I mean, we've got guns on the wall and John Wayne's yeah. over there looking at me, <laughs> so like <laughs> might as well bring up spaghetti western. So a, a while back, more than a while back, um, when Clint Eastwood would uh, be in a movie like The Good, Bad, and the Ugly, uh, instead of shooting it here, like in the hills of L.A. or whatever, they would actually fly everybody over to Italy because they would get taxed less and it would cost them less to just pull extras and actors from Italian population towns and stuff like that and then shoot it in Italian deserts huh. that look a lot like the American Southwest. So that started this, pardon me, a whole, the whole new term of Spaghetti Western. Did you see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Leo goes over to Italy and shoots a bunch of westerns in Italy. It's those Hollywood big brains at work, right? So it's like we're going to get tax less, whatever. They go over there and they. I wouldn't they have been say, able to Great. tell the difference. So if you think about an old yeah. western movie, usually those older ones you're thinking about got shot in Italy. So it's kind of the same terroir as the as the Arizona West. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I didn't know that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, 
like I said, I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. Yeah. Um, a lot of people didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Fun fact, too, uh, while we're doing fun facts and we've got wine in our hand. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, Catalina Island, uh, if I'm not mistaken, has buffalo on it. And that's why they have like buffalo. bison? Yeah, like bison. Damn. Because in the middle of it, they used to shoot Western movies in the middle of it because it, it looks a little bit like a desert. So I was just shipped. about to ask how they got <laughs> they there. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's an island. I don't know. These bison would float? I don't right. fucking know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's it. That huh. was the fun fact. They bison float. Swim? <laughs> I've been to Catalina Island twice. Yeah. I don't feel like I was nearly old enough to yeah. do all the things that you can do on Catalina Island and, and have a great, great time. Don't get me wrong. I had a great time. I was sure. in eighth grade. But sure. You snorkel? Just trying to do a Catalina wine mixer. Did you snorkel? I did snorkel. Yeah. I did snorkel. So I, did snorkel. Uh, I stepped on a sea urchin. Like an eight-year-old oh, Catalina. Urchin, yeah. That or, sting? I want to say it was a sea urchin. The, the little mm -hmm. thing with the... Spiky? Little, little sea porcupine. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. sure it does Those bad boys. Yeah. Those things suck. Yeah, they do. They need some more wine in their life. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, most things do. So you started uh, on your wine venture. You are obviously in the service industry for a good amount of time. Um, when diving into your, your education, your wine education, did you start like picking and pulling at things that you never realized? Like, like as soon as you put that hat on, you yeah. know, how has that kind of impacted your life from here on out? Uh, immensely. Okay. Uh, I, I would say the, the mentors that I was working around and, and starting to dive into wine, you know, in tandem with doing a lot of new restaurant opening trainings and just um, continuing to try and get better at that, it it effectively it made a whole new path in my life. By that point, you're so. pretty much immersifying yourself in yeah the world of wine. But don't get me wrong; it started with I really like this. I really like this Syrah. Right. I just really like it. And then someone may say, you know, would start to ask like, "Hey, Ryan." can you sit down with these three trainees and talk wine with them? And I would want to have something in my back pocket to talk about, right? And it just kind of started from there. So I'd pop myself a bottle of Syrah and then sit down with the interwebs and whatever book was handy and just start start studying up. There nice. you go. Yeah. Uh, how long did it take you to get your, – you're, you're a sommelier. Yeah. So just about to be certified when everything shut down. So no way. Yeah. Uh, we were about a week and a half out. That's level I mean, I've been two level two, which is so that's certified. That's certified. Sommelier. That's really like a certified. Right. Sommelier. Um, so right now I'm a level one. But I mean, we were tasting wine every week. Um, we were, you know, ready to go. Practicing What's your study service, process practicing, for that? Um, for level two. I mean, the study process is repetitions table side, so practicing all the different etiquette steps that, that the Court of the Master Sommeliers requires from you. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Are there different businesses you can go through to get a sommelier? Like, do you have to go through the Court of the Master Somme, or does, are there other... No, there are a couple different venues you can go through. There's or organizations, I should say. You can go, and the, the biggest one, aside from the Court of Master Somme's, is what they call the W set. Okay. W S E T, um, and that is more on the retailer side, so it's less of the table service aspect and hospitality aspect. It's more of the technical aspect. It's more about knowing, you know, what you're talking about. Yeah, not that, taste. Not that table side. You aren't asked to know all those things too, but it's and more, you're more on in the it for the hospitality. Yeah. That, that's what you're going for. Is Correct. the the service the the, the execution start to finish? Well, how. How many restaurants have we opened together? That's a very good point. Right? That, I mean, that's a very good point. It's, it's one of those things where, as much as the wine will always be a passion in my life, teaching and learning every day is, you know, that's, that's definitely I think the heart and soul of it. You, I've heard you and, and Regan say it best um, you're never going to know everything. Mm -hmm. And for someone that's eager to learn, wine should be number one on their list of things to learn. It's a good thing to know about the world. It is basically as old as human civilization, maybe even a little older. Uh, hmm. it, I mean, it, it, it basically started when people in huts 
had fruit that they had gathered and put it in some pots out in front of the huts and naturally occurring yeast comes along, ferments it and makes it go through the fermentation process. And then all of a sudden people are going over to that jar and they're like, we got all these jars, but I like the fruit <laughs> that comes from that jar. <laughs> that one makes a me lot. feel fuzzy. Yeah. And it makes life better. <laughs> So we should figure out what's going on in that jar. And so it all started from way back then. I mean, alcohol level back then coming out of a, a jar when you weren't even trying, that's like 3%. Mm -hmm. uh, this is like yes. 13. So, But anything back then, hey, anything back then is go pe full pe game. People like getting a buzz, man. I love that. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting you say that wine has a lot to do with things about the world. Because if I, I forget who the conversation I was having it with, but when you're tasting a vintage of wine mm -hmm. and something may taste off one year or they can directly correlate that with, oh, well, there was a bad fire or, oh, there was a drought that year or, oh, there was this. And you can pinpoint what's going on in the world at a certain time period mm -hmm. just based off of how this glass tastes. That's the craziest thing to me because when you drink beer, that's not that's not the case. Well, I guess it could be. Well, well beer doesn't age as long as wine can mm -hmm. so there's just more opportunity to have some of those history points like prohibition i mean in prohibition you couldn't you couldn't make wine or have wine but you could buy grapes to make wine in your house right did people so, do that oh yeah dude when when, when immigrants house? came over first came over zinfandel was one of the first grapes that they brought over um and so, like, bathtub wine. Bathtub wine. Uh, and it was... I've heard I mean, that expression, but I didn't about, think that was a real thing. Oh, it was a real thing. They would bathtub make wine in their bathtubs. Yeah. They would have it go through fermentation in their bathtubs, and then it was... So well, where to use the bath? you got to love the American well, dream. It, well, yeah. <laughs> the American dream at that point was we <laughs> packed up all of our junk and came all the way across to this new land where we have all this new opportunity, but I'll be damned if I sit at my dinner table every night without a glass of wine in my hand. That's for sure. And so that's America. where a lot of it came from. Huh. So, Even if yeah. it means not taking a bath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe for a little while. Maybe you know, a little It while. takes a little while. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so aside from the wine, there are uh, other things that I know – of you to do very well. I know you acted for a good amount of time as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Jump. Boom. Where'd my wine key go? That's important. That is important. There it is. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I like it. He's pulled out another bottle, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that means bottoms up. Um, yeah, I know that you... you Anyone who knows you knows you're a very lively person, and you have this 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 way about you and and how you communicate, and that that probably was a huge benefactor to you as a trainer because you're able to relate to people and talk to people in a certain way that that levels with them. That's nice. A lot of that, well, of course, man. Yeah. A lot of that has to come from um, obviously being around people for a good amount of time, but the animate character has to come from somewhere else. I was not expecting you to bring this question up. That's a thing. <laughs> Game on. Uh, Game on. <laughs> on the spot. He says. Uh, yeah, so uh, in my earlier days in, in middle school and high school, I was quite the uh, theatrical kid. And, and yeah, you're right. It, it definitely has impacted my ability to uh, manage uh, w whatever amounts of anxiety a human being usually goes through when they, when they stand in front of people and talk. Um, that stage fright. And, yeah. I mean, it's the number up. one fear in the world. Exactly. And so, um, but I, I think I just attacked it like I try to attack a lot of things, which is if it's something that is intimidating or anxiety producing, I would rather just do it so many times that I get so used to it or get start to get used to certain things about it. Just where I feel it. more confident. Kind of like right. how seamlessly you're opening this bottle while holding a full-on conversation. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, got to get to the wine somehow. Uh, so, so yeah, that definitely came from it, and that's something I do, it, you know, in life in general. It's just like, well, I'm okay with not knowing stuff. I'm just going to give it a try until I get okay at it, you know? 
Come let's get here, let's get Marway some some. I agree. Some grape juice. And you know that kind of goes back to uh, serving tables and tending bar. Oh yeah. Um, I think one of the most awesome mm. things about the industry. I mean, we could all go on and on about the cool things about the restaurant industry. Can you do it? Can you do it? Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Will there be a drop? Nailed it. Nailed it. Um, Thank you, sir. So, absolutely. Miss Marley, absolutely. Boom. Cheers. Cheers, indeed. What do we have, what do we have here? Oh, uh, so we have a wonderful varietal called Friulano. Friulano. S- Friulano. Uh, we might be able to make the, connect the dot that, that it is from Friuli. So Friuli is in northeastern Italy as well. Um, whereas with the Suave, we had a little bit more like crisp minerality wrapped in this, you know, fresh melon, like, you know, sort of thing going on. Friulano is going to be a little bit more round. Um, it's going to have a little bit more weight, uh, to it. So when you talk about light bodied and full bodied, I usually talk about the difference between a light sheet and a heavy blanket. So it's, it's less of a flavor thing and more of just the weight. On your palate. Is this going to be a tannic structure then? No. Or no? No. Uh, earlier, Marley mentioned orange wine, right? Uh, so tannins uh, are basically a mouth drying effect, right? So those come from grape skins, uh, seeds, and stems. Mm-hmm. So in white wine, generally, those kind of get all, those don't really have a whole lot of contact. We were talking about orange wine earlier. Orange wine is basically white wine that has had contact with the grape skins. And it, it kind of shows itself a little bit differently in white wine as, as what we call a phenolic bitterness as opposed to like grape skins. Right. Okay. Um, with this one, uh, it's going to be fresh. It's going to be a little bit more round. It's going to have, um, you can tell by the color that it's a little deeper color. It's not as like bright and brilliant. Um, and that's probably because of some, some Oak influence, um, that color of the actual Oak barrel, like gets into the wine a little bit. Um, so, Oh yeah, man. By all means, excited. let me know what you think. Let's yeah, it. it's it's good to kind of go from light body to full bodied whenever you're drinking wine, or it's not the only way you can do it, but it's it's a way I've found to kind of move through a meal, or move through your day, or move through your life. <laughs> I feel like so. I get that oak mm-hmm. influence. Definitely, definitely tastes round. Definitely tastes round. Yeah, definitely. It's round. not as it's not as like focus, like Jazzy. laser focused. Yeah. yeah, not as laser focused. This one's a little bit laser. Like, little what do you think? Like Is that a winner? Yeah. Far out. This one, yeah. this one. This is more refreshing, I feel like. What's that? She thick. Oh, yeah, she thick. <laughs> she thick. Yeah. <laughs> Two C's. Um, so, so, yeah, that's good stuff for sure. And, and like I said, uh, Italians really know how to make a wine, in my opinion. Um, I know we were talking about the mouth drying effect with tannins, but um, the real thing in play right here, I think, is, is a mouth watering mm-hmm. effect, yeah. which, you know. Anybody with a lemonade stand can tell you people want their thirst quenched, right? Right. You, you know, lemonade kind of gets all those sal- uh, saliva actions going in your mouth, and it's the same here. It's that acid uh, acid level in a wine that does that. When, you're, when your mouth starts watering, your whole body kind of tells itself, I'm, c- I'm kind of ready to eat. Right. Like, I kinda, are you ready to eat? We should eat. And so starting with a nice mouth-watering white wine in the beginning of your meal really gets you primed for, for going in hard on a, on a big meal, which Absolutely. is awesome. So by the time you hit main course, you're throwing down on some really delicious red wine, and then it's like, well... Well, and by the time you're done with a bottle of this, you're playing with the name all hammered. <laughs> Friuli. 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 <laughs> well, you're going to like the, the name in the next one. I'm going to pop it right now and let it air out just a little bit. It's not super old or anything, but... Okay. Um, deserves a little airing out, so we can talk about it. Now, a when you later. let a wine air out, that there, there's uh, decanting, right? Which, yeah. which you typically you're only going to do with a, a bottle of wine that is older to let it breathe, right? Or yeah. Am I completely so, good wrong rule on of that? thumb, <laughs> good rule of thumb is um, about five year, three to five years, depending on the wine. So, if it's three years old, um, you could within reason decant it in general it's going to air out in the glass or in the bottle so if you pop it and it's a 2017 we're in the year that will not be named for uh, real and, the worst uh, year if ever. it's if it's it's better with wine though that's uh, true right yeah. 
See you know, the theme? It, you know what's funny <laughs> is is uh, I was speaking with Matt Thornton. We had him on the podcast uh, a couple weeks ago. Do you know Matt from uh, Vinyl Station? Uh, you know, I think I've met him once, but I can't say I know him. Okay, so what we're, we're talking about uh, the year that shall not be named. Yes, and he's like, if you think about it, it's fine. His exact words, it's fine. And I'm like, what? How are you so calm with everything going on? He's like, it's fine. Well, he's like, you're living better than Louis the Fourteenth. I'm like, okay, well, that's true. It's a very solid point. He's like, he's shit in a hole. Also a solid point. <laughs> yeah, but with so, everything going on, you so, know. So the idea of, you know, perspective, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think that's a huge thing. I think that's definitely a suit of armor that I try to wear in my life. You know? Yeah. I look at it and I go, you know, even even with all the wacko things that have been going on before that it's like you know maybe today isn't the best day in my life but compared to maybe other people living on the planet right now or people that have lived on the planet my life probably isn't that bad and then I take another swig of wine and I'm like (laughs) you know what wine you and me are gonna make it (laughs) Everything's the wine doesn't talk with back wine, with but. wine. With wine, I feel <laughs> it is is the hashtag there. Yeah, with wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not as bad. Yeah. Better with wine. With wine. Better with wine. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Uh, Very nice. And what what a great time to like learn more about wine. Yeah. What else are you gonna do? That's you, you a good watched point. all your shows, man. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Watch them again and, with wine. And Netflix is better with my wine. dude. See now <laughs> he's getting it. <laughs> now he's getting it. Uh, uh, um. So going back to. I'm glad that we have this uh, this this incredible glass of wine. This one, I actually, I very much like this one. Good. Um, not that I didn't like the other one, but sure. this one kind of speaks to my soul a little bit. It's it's got a little bit more going on. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's just got a little bit more going on. And no, I love nothing oak. against the other. I'm, way. A, I'm a huge anything like yeah. any red wine that's going to have a yeah. major oak influence. I, does that have something to do with new world versus old world? Not necessarily. No. No steel steel or or. Uh, French oak or Slovenian oak, uh, like Italy uses a lot of Slovenian oak, um, but and there are slight differences you can get from the wine when you use those different types of oak. But mm-hmm. uh, in general, it doesn't. It's not a, a difference. Okay, in one place or the other. So to jump back to your acting career, <laughs> uh, career. which I love that you weren't prepared for that one. I wasn't because <laughs> that's Were where the most genuine movies? conversation comes from. I can't say. I have signed some non-disclosure agreements that. Yeah. No, I, I can see. You didn't see that scene. Yeah, you like, didn't see that scene where he whooped Jean Claude Van Damme's ass. Dude, honestly, True. I get. I'm actually Jason Statham. I was gonna say a guy like a Jason. Yeah, don't Statham let the beard vibe. and the nerdiness fool you. I'm. I'm very good at martial arts. Yeah, you know why we haven't that. heard from Chuck Norris in a long time? <laughs> this guy. It's a black belt sommelier. The more you bring that black up, belt the more sommelier. other black belts <laughs> will try to claim. Thr- it's a it's a rough life as a as a wandering yeah. uh, wine samurai. Everyone always tries wine to take samurai. <laughs> oh yes, don't flex the knowledge, dude. Three, dude, dude I won't. <sighs> um, so what? Obviously, everyone finds a passion, and sure. you you acted on that passion. Did you go to school for that? Uh, for acting. Uh, no. Uh, you know, again, just like with this, it was like you know. I, I'm just going to get up there and see what I learned from it and how I can do at it. And then I'm going to listen to people like uh, teachers, directors, anybody that had feedback, which was an important lesson, too. If you think about it, like the the ability to take feedback and then grow on it, I think, is is a superpower that a lot of people uh, underestimate. And the people that inspire me the most uh are a lot of the people that I'm fortunate enough to teach. And that means all the trainees, that means all the, you know, any anybody that I've been able to share a gem of knowledge with. Um, it's a matter of discipline. What's that? It's a matter of discipline. It's a matter of discipline. And, and I respect that because I work every day to have that. Mm-hmm. You know, just that idea of like, dude, like, no matter how much accreditation or achievement someone's, you know, accrued, there's always something more to learn. There's always a person that you can look across the table at and appreciate or empathize with, always. Absolutely. So, I love that. Yeah, man. You, you, when you say you jumped into the role, 
jumped into the role, jumped into the the, the world of acting. Did you do productions? Did you do uh, yeah? Uh, so you know, training? Did you do? If I were workshops? to reach way back, in middle school, I was in Peter Pan. Remember Peter oh. Pan? Yeah. Remember you remember Captain Hook? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was Smee. Uh, nice. I wasn't necessarily oh the main character, God. but hell, I had a lot of fun doing it. You know, <laughs> you're like and the if you can, yeah, yeah. And if you can think of a little chubby me, I could see that. Why, where I had to take a pencil and draw on a beard. God, yeah. if I only knew. And, uh, yeah, look, yeah. At that. look at that fool. I'm oh, and, there. and then I just, yeah, ca- I oh. wasn't Captain Hook. I was, I was Smee, so oh, I shoved Smee, a pillow yeah, in my yeah. shirt, and I just, just oh, went yeah. around, did dooter, the damn thing. Little dooter, didn't care, uh, <laughs> and got a lot of laughs, and I liked that. Nice. And moving into high school, uh, there was an awkward phase in freshman year, which I think anybody can probably look at. I don't know one person who's like, dude, I was the coolest kid in freshman year. <laughs> mm. I don't know about everybody else, but, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I, and I, then, know <laughs> I know a couple chads that yeah, would beg to differ. Right, you know? right. Sophomore year, uh, dove in deep with the theater department, and uh, my school had a really, we were fortunate to have a, a, a very big, beautiful facility and, and had a lot of fun, really got into that team aspect, playing off of each other, improvising we held each other account- accountable we were trying to work i mean as silly as it sounds even in high school we were trying to work at a high level mm-hmm. like our school district was known for putting on good productions and right. it was like dude like were you born keep here? it up uh yeah i was uh, uh i'm a native arizona oh very nice and yeah. so you went to high school here i did super dope i did it was cool it's a great it's a great place to grow up yeah uh i I love my state. I've traveled, traveled a lot. And I miss the mountains whenever I leave. Yeah. You know, when, when we spent uh, some time out in Texas, uh, you oh, spend yeah. some time in Chicago and, and you know, whatever, you, you don't get that. You know, you don't get yeah. the, the over, overlooking of the mountains. You don't yeah. realize how much they're looking at you. Well, it also kind of makes you feel like you're in a bubble, you know, right. a, a little bit more. Not only does Arizona have a big, beautiful sky, uh, but you, you are kind of hugged by these mountains on all sides. 100%. So when you're growing up, you're just like, yep, I know exactly where that mountain is. And those is. sunsets. Yeah. That mountain, I know sunset. I know Flagstaff's up there. I know Tucson's down there. Like, it it feels like a macro neighborhood as much as having, like, your neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So so it's an awesome place. Not to mention, we we do get good weather. The summer teaches you to survive. <laughs> stay inside. Yeah, stay inside. Stay inside. inside. Dude, yeah. For That's real. the truth. And For everyone real. knows to pay their SRP bill on time during the summer. Hell yeah. <laughs> They'll come after you. I know. I worked for them for a little while. Really? Yeah. I worked in a call center. Ooh. I know. Oh, it's one of those jobs. You, going back to the whole thing where it's like you can always learn from anything you do. Uh, I was at a time where I needed a job. I just needed a job. Right. And I was like, well, you, you can make actually really good money here. And At a call center? You, you can make pretty good money there, and they have good benefits at that point. That's, that's a big yeah. one. And have to they made me go money. through, they made us go through six weeks of training. And I actually learned, I got, uh, I got uh, customer service credit through Rio Salado College. So that, that course that they do there actually, actually taught me a lot of things about just. It gave you college just credit? Customer service, 12 credits. Shit. Yeah. Yep. Six, <laughs> it was like a six weeks course. In customer service. And that's something that I've always had in my back pocket that I've always felt was kind of like a hidden, like, just kind of an ace in the hole because a lot of people just didn't know basic, like when I would get on a restaurant floor, people didn't know basic de-escalation, not to like exacerbate a situation, but to actually bring it, like, I get it. You're very upset that your food took a little bit longer. I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z to make sure you feel great, mm-hmm. uh, and you need to know I'm I am right on top of it. It's one of like the reasons, just kind of that kind of stuff. That's one of the reasons why I'm thankful for my very small stint in 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 uh, cold calling for sales. Yeah, um, because when I graduated to being a server, you have that kind of finesse in in talking. Yeah, uh, in where you're not asking, you're telling. This is what you're gonna get because sure. I know exactly what you want. Yeah, when you become a little bit more confident in your mm-hmm. footing and you're and you're good to go and you know exactly where everything is and you, you know just by the time of day that so and so is coming onto the clock. Right. So by the time you make a promise, 
it will get taken care of because so-and-so is getting on the clock in 15 minutes and they'll have that ice bucket ready to go. Like mm -hmm. they'll have, they'll have you set up for a success. That's I wish a, I could have had that de-escalation uh, uh, knowledge prior because for the most part, any new server going into any service industry is just there with a pretty face. Well, it's You're it's yelling. A, it's a pretty uh, face and kind of a soft skin because yeah. it's not an it's not an easy trench to get thrown in. Mm -hmm. You 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 meet a lot of people that expose you to the world like you've never been exposed to exp before. I mean, some people come in like when did you start at all of an Ivy? Twenty thirteen. So 17. how old are you? You're 17. 17. My, my first job, I was 16. I actually wasn't even allowed legally to work. Mm -hmm. But I was I there. feel like when, when I wanted to get a job when I was 15, they're like, no, you have to be 16. I turned 16. They're yeah. like, oh, you have to be 17. Right. Finally, Depends I turned 17. I'm like, right. you motherfuckers have been telling me the wrong, wrong <laughs> news this whole time. Like, I just want a job at this point. They just yeah, want to totally. give you a job. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're just they're being like, yeah, a hard ass. You have to be 17. Right. Oh, it's so like, great when you really, have, though? I remember you <laughs> have someone older that's like, oh, I was working Do when I? I was 14. It's like, I wish I could. I wish I could have done that, but yeah. labor laws prohibit that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think that, you know, I think any job, honestly, any job, that isn't you sitting in a dark room inputting numbers, not saying hello to a soul, any job should have some sort of customer service or hospitality training where you have a human look at you in the face and go, you are now in an, air, in a, in an environment where you will have s factors that are escalating that you're going to have them aplenty. You need to be that calm person or charming person you need to be that nice and pleasant person because no one else will be hmm. like someone needs to to tell a lot of people that <laughs> mm -hmm. in my opinion that any situation can be de-escalated with wine i mean better with wine. <laughs> that's not yeah. better with yeah. wine <laughs> cheers to cheers that. indeed situations yeah. better with wine. situational wine so, yeah. In pleasant. traveling through your uh, life, uh, I know you as a phenomenal singer as well. That's so nice of you to say. One world of the world class singer. Uh -huh. <laughs> world class singer. World class singer. Wow. Mixture of Fergie and Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 I've been called the songbird of my generation. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, I, I still bring this story up to this day. Oh, uh, no. I was, what is it? Oh God, yeah. You, oh, it's you, good. Oh, it's good. You got me in your sights. I hate I, it. I was, uh, <laughs> I was 17, 18. I just started. Oh boy. And I forget, uh, if it was a trainee of yours or what the situation was, <laughs> but you're just going through the restaurant, singing a song. I did that a lot. And, Someone who was brand new. I think I'd been there for about a year, so it was probably it was probably 2014. -ish. <laughs> I know exactly what story. You I, <laughs> I, I'd been there for her about a year, <laughs> and uh, you're singing a song and walking directly into the kitchen, and I'm there washing my hands, and I turn over and I'm like, "Damn, he hit that note, nice." <laughs> and as soon as I'm thinking that in my head, there's a trainee that's like, "Hey, who sings that song?" And Ryan goes, "Oh, so and so," and like, maybe you should let them sing it. Oh, and without. Without a second of thought or anything, he goes, I'll sing whatever the fuck I want to. <laughs> and walks out. <laughs> and it, because everyone knows you, you you're you're just you're a genuinely nice person. Aww. And it came it didn't come from anywhere other than how fucking dare you? <laughs> <laughs> like, from that I moment. Sing. Do you remember what song it was? I wish. So so I can't believe you brought that <laughs> that story up. That's awesome. It's a um, glorious moment. It was it was a good moment, uh, and and it was very just instinctual. Uh, I think it came from a place where you know now having moved into more of a, a professionalism place uh, and in my career and all those things, I think uh, I would never do it now. And now I just <laughs> kind of see everybody everybody as one part of a team. Like that's literally how I see it. It's just right. like every single person is important, no matter how long you've been here, no matter how long you know you're gonna be here. We're just gonna all work together. Mm -hmm. Like it, everything else doesn't matter. That's that's my philosophy. And back then, I think anybody that's worked in a restaurant can agree. 
there's a certain amount of perceived hierarchy, right? So a person comes in on day one and they're talking to someone who's been there for five years. It's sort of like, who the, who are you again? <laughs> right? What's like, your name? I knew, I knew servers that would not learn a person's name unless they had been in the building for three months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They were just like, sure. dude, why should I learn this person's name? Oh, there's Guilty. people like that. And they would say that to their face. Guilty. Yeah, they yeah. would say that to their face, and you know, not in a I mean it. way. It's just not in a mean yeah. way. It's just like you I don't see the turnover. Attached. You're there for <laughs> the one thing. That's it's literally sure. like you can't name the pup. If I name the puppy, <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> you know. Oh, that's it's, terrible. It's terrible. If I, name it, it's it's, if I name it, then I'll get attached, and I can't handle that. I'm already yeah. roughed up enough. Yeah, right. <laughs> my heart's gone through Been enough. Been here for um, three and a half years. But no, that I think at that moment. Uh, it was one of those like, dude, are you, I'm sorry, Mr. Day two, who are you? <laughs> like, uh, and, and then I went on with my life and then I, and then I think I kind of made a point to sing around that person. Good. It's like, why do you build me up? <laughs> Buttercup, baby, just let me down. It's when you walk right? by that person just <laughs> subtly and you're like, so-and-so sings this song, by the way. <laughs> just as petty as possible. Oh, God. <laughs> I hope I wasn't. Man, oh, man. I, I only bring that story up because it was a break in character that I'm right. so glad I saw. <laughs> I'm Maybe so that's why glad I drink I wine. That's a, <laughs> because that would have been better with wine. Probably right. Mm-hmm. Would have been good. Yeah. Um, so what are you doing now? Uh, what am I doing now? Uh, so obviously times are weird. Um, and so for a while there, it was a lot of pivoting. Um, one, one thing, uh, you know, along the lines of... of just trying to learn as much as I can and be useful where, wherever I can be is that I, I ended up gathering this collection of hats that I can wear in a restaurant. You can throw me behind a bar or put I me was in about to ask you want. what hats are you like wearing? Because I, I, had, uh, I did not uh, realize you were about to talk about a, a, a trove of talents. Oh, no, I'm not talking about it. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to say I have a trove of talents, but I, I, I will say that, that I've been accused of being a Swiss Army knife when it comes to... To I'd be say in that's a accurate. restaurant, like I'd say that's accurate, and so, and so I think that's kind of what I've been up to. Um, I've been working on a cool project where I'm reaching out and connecting with winemakers, talking to more, uh, talking more about the craft that they're into. I just uh, did kind of a, I'm, I'm treating it kind of like a soft opening uh, on a website that uh, uh, I took my first swing at building. That's Let's talk about I that for never, a second. What's the name thought. of the website? So the the website's called Ryan's Wines. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's Ryan's dash wines dot com uh, dot com. Okay. And, um, you know, it, it's supposed to be a very approachable, very user friendly platform that people can use to have a glass of wine in their hand and learn one thing about wine or as much as they want to learn about wine. So you it's, have tutorial videos on there. So I have I have write ups on different varietals, different regions. Um, I am going to start implementing some uh, some video things where we'll just go over how to taste wine or how to inspect a certain aspect of wine. Um, I'd like to get to a point where we're doing staff tastings. Like we'll just pop a bottle and everybody will, you know, gather around and we'll all just kind of get general impressions and. How does that look I'm, I'm like on a on a website? Staff tastings. So so that's actually something I just thought might be cool uh, at like a day ago. Would you film it? Yeah. So there would be a group of people that you work with. Yeah. Pop a bottle. Mm-hmm. Right. And you're filming anybody and everybody. Yeah. Tasting, talking, learning. Well, real servers and bartenders. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, just because, just because someone says that I'm a wine guy doesn't mean everybody needs to hear the way I describe wine. Wine is such a subject that you can learn something from anybody that tastes the wine or smells the wine. Like if you lift it up to your sniffer and go, smells like grapes. It's like, yep, it's, <laughs> it's made from grapes. You're not wrong. What right. else do you get? And what else do you get from it? And someone says, I don't know, I don't get much. And if you look at them again and go, well, what do you like about it? They might go, I like that it's alcoholic. And you go, yeah. That's an interesting question to ask like, anybody that's tasting anything is yeah. what what do you like about it? Well, and that's a big thing for me. It, it there seems to be this wall that people are afraid to jump over or throw their hat over when it comes to talking about wine. 
Um, and it's not easy for, it, like in general, it's not easy to talk about wine, especially when, when someone feels like they don't have the knowledge to back it up or they don't have, you know, a, a, some sort of certification or So whatever. would you say that's for the fear of being wrong? Correct. Or the unknown or, or embarrassing yourself in front of a new group of people or a group of people you consider friends. And I, I guess that's where it goes back to that idea of like, dude, just, just throw your hat over that, that wall, get into it, try it, because that's the only way you're going to get better at it. Like, I try to be the dumbest guy in the room. I'm sure I do a good job doing an impression of that. Game on, on a lot of a kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that means that I'm trying to get in a group of people that speak so fluently about this stuff mm -hmm. that there's no way I can't walk away without a pebble in my pocket that I didn't have when I first walked into that group of people. It's you know funny I mean? because we, uh, him and I used to work together and we would have wine meetings and some of the best wine conversations that you can laugh about later, but at the same time you're, you're learning something mm -hmm. because everyone has a different perspective. Totally. I'm not going to bring it up right now, but I can't, we have plenty of story where someone was like, I think this smells like cat urine. Sure. And you're just like, sure. The fuck did you get that from? <laughs> But okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to see if I can get that yeah. from this wine, you know, and, and pull from different people's perspectives because at the same time, the uh, smell, taste, everything sure. originates from a memory. Sure. And it's interesting to see where people's memories might lead. Yeah, no, and honestly, that is a huge par a part of tasting. Like, that's why you hear people say weird stuff like, this smells like burnt rubber on an Arizona freeway. You know what I mean? I don't know what I'm getting, but that's what I get out of this. And it's because the human mind and this amazing olfactory instrument that we have attaches tastes, flavors, smells to a memory. Like my first glass of French rosé, which is not some sort of sugar bomb weird rosé. It's, it's it's more dry. Really, it's way dry. Yeah. It's very mouthwatering. It's got a lot of minerality to it. It's super crisp and refreshing. Um, I remember uh, my first uh, glass of that was on a patio in one of the hottest days we had had in the entire summer. It was like 119 degrees. Dang. And someone brought me this wine and was like, you need this. And I go, maybe I do. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I on the patio? <laughs> Your dehydration brain just starts <laughs> right. getting to you. You're like, I don't know where right. I'm at. Right. And so, um, you know, I'll always have that memory that, you know, that's where I got it. And maybe because it was so hot, I just could taste everything going on in that glass. Right. Strawberry, rhubarb, like, w like all sorts of weird like berry aspects and mineral like big stuff and it maybe it was because i was kind of put in that pressure situation where it's like oh god my my body's just so aware that it's so hot outside but now when i drink rosé i always equate it to mm -hmm. kind of that like cool towel on your forehead when it's scorching hot outside it's really refreshing. and yeah, super refreshing. And, and to me, when you're talking to people about wine, you can get technical with them. Like if someone wants to like get nerdy and like go, okay, so what's the acidity level on this? <laughs> you know, you can go into it if you want or, and any good server should, should be able to speak on it. But more often than not, if I looked you dead in the eye and said, this is going to be like a cool towel on your forehead on a hot day like this. Someone's just gonna go. I, I, I want just to go. pour. Yeah, I want to go to there. I can you? That can you take me there? It's, it's like, yeah. yep. Just be right back with a bottle yeah. <laughs> and a towel. Yeah, Grant. What's your favorite wine? What's your favorite uh, varietal? Uh, I mean, that's like I used to think it was for squares, you know, until I yeah. learned it was like for food. Yeah. So it depends on like the food. Like I dig it. Yeah. If it's like right, steak, let's say you're, let's say you're I doing a, a, a medium rare steak. Ooh. You're doing a medium rare uh, right. fillet. Good question. Oh, just nice cab. Yeah. Something bright. Nice. Yeah. Uh, spe speaking of a nice fillet and the fact that our, our wine glasses are empty, uh, you want to pour the next wine? Yeah. Oh, what, well, we yes, got? what we got? Because it's a red. It's a red. It. It's a good so, that's a good call on the Cabernet. And the reason is the tannins, right? Yeah. Those, that that's skin like contact. That's so the it's best mouth. part about reds. So, 
So that mouth drying agent, you think about like a well marbled filet or a mac and cheese or something that's super mouth coating. You want to have a fork in one hand and a glass of something tannic in the other yeah. and just go back and forth. I kind of want to be like you and just have the full bottle if I'm being honest. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> don't, don't tempt me. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, that's the best thing about wine is like how well it pairs with food, you know, and you get like a nice buzz and more flavors with whatever you're eating. Yeah, I almost feel like you can uh, even in, in, in the case you and I had this conversation uh, in the case with red meat, uh, you know, that mouth coating feel when you have, you know, a bite of a filet. And next thing you know, your tongue is coated with grease and, and whatever. All the great stuff. All the great things. Yeah. But then you Fried take a swig, and it literally shaves all of that off and prepares you to taste everything again. Did he just call it a swig? <laughs> I yeah. think he did. Did I just say that? Maybe. I like it. <laughs> yeah, no. I took a swig of it. And then you I never use that? Well, I say a swig. Swig. A swig. Oh, a swig. Ah. Swig. Swig. Swiggy swag? Swig. <laughs> That's such Ooh. Weird. All right, what oh, am I smelling pretty. here? She pretty. What are you smelling, dude? So again, we're up in. Uh, what's up? What do you smell? Talk to me. Got that stank <laughs> face. Dude, I, I love that coffee. Face. Talk to me. Like, coffee? Yeah. Like, yeah. That's like allowed. right when I got off the nose, I was like, espresso. Espresso or tobacco? A little bit. Ooh, tobacco. For like sure. that jumped out. Yeah. Yeah. A little tobacco. Oh yeah. Tobacco. Super savory. Okay. So northern Italy, especially. Well, let me let me back up. So Italy, great. Kind of rule of thumb is what grows together goes together okay what grows together goes together italy is about um it's just about the size of california give or take uh if it's you want to put to that think in perspective it, yeah. yeah and that's also it, it basically battles with france every year for the number one volume producing wine producing country in the world and it's not it, it's like almost the size of California. Right. And it's broken up to, into all these states, right? So when you hear Tuscany or the Veneto or Piedmont, all those are actual states um, within that region. And each one is very about authenticity, okay? We make the truest version of this wine. Like, so when you hear Chianti, they take great pride in Chianti and that it can only be there. The government's very strict on what kind of grapes they can use, how they make it, et cetera. And so it was all built out of each generation and each harvest year, you would get this wine and then you would have, you know, maybe down in the south, down in the south of Italy, that's actually below the top of Africa. Earlier we were talking about how you can get closer to the equator. Mm -hmm. Well, the closer you get to the equator, the hotter it gets. So down in, in the southern tip of Italy, they're about spicier foods and tomato sauces. Up in the north, where this wine's made and where the other two wines are made that we, we just had, the white wines, they're about creamier sauces because it was colder weather. Back in the day, they could make creamier sauces because it wouldn't go bad as quickly. It was just generally colder weather. So things wouldn't... Things Does that wouldn't... play into the uh, salivating effect? So, so Because for yes these two no. first ones, the, the two first white wines, yeah. I had a lot of that. Yeah. Th which I would assume that that's high acidity. Right. So I got a lot of that, so, and with even with this one a little bit, and mm -hmm. is that gonna? So it's it's a style, and if you think about it as sort of like, like you have a mixing board over here. Like if, think if you're a music producer, you have a mixing board. If if we make a wine, right? We're in our winery, and we make a wine, and it's got like too much tannin going on, like too much tannin, and we figure that out one harvest year. It's like shit, man. We we had it way too mouth drying on that one. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to pull the grapes a little early this year so that they're a little more tart and acidic. So that mouth watering comes in, you, you turn down the tannin level and up the acid level. So it rounds it out. It's all playing on the same playground. And this is where wine kind of crosses over from a science to an art, mm -hmm. right? That, that means that, and, and that's looking at, Vintage years, too, where it's like weather was weird this year, and it seems like the grapes are ripening quicker. So we need to pull them earlier if we want to get what we had last year. In a relation you know I mean? with music production, because I, I think it's very interesting that you pulled 
that aspect with the mixer and if it's this then we're going to turn this up right you can technically play with the flavor and play with the post production yeah That's regardless the of the grapes that you get yeah so if you get ones that i i, I don't i'm going to put this into uh terms that i don't even understand That's but okay um, you know, let's say that your grapes <laughs> let's lean in, dude. Let's yeah, yeah. go. <laughs> oh, we lean. game on. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. you get grapes that may be um, more acidic, or you get grapes that may be uh, more sour, or whatever. Sure. Once you mash the grapes and everything else, mm -hmm. and you have the um, juice, the the juice, but it's yeah. it's the fortified. What's what's the term for it? When you have for the fermentation. For yeah. I might be thinking of champagne production. Champagne production is a whole okay. different circus. That's, that's what I'm thinking of. When yeah. you have I mean, your, you're base, still using, your base wine is what I was thinking. Yeah, you're thinking, you're thinking, yeah. So there's a base wine in champagne that they then go through a few more steps with in order to make it what we know as champagne. Okay. To clarify it, same. to add those fun little bubbles and and make it the the awesome thing that it is. It, 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 that's why champagne is actually, you know, it demands the price that it demands. Mm -hmm. It's because it's all hand done. It is a very in-depth process, and it takes a long time. So you think about a winemaker. Okay, let's talk. Let's let's actually bring it round. Okay. Okay. We'll bring it round to to what we're actually drinking. Okay? I love it. Okay. So first uh, first of all, I'm going to taste the wine. You haven't done that yet. I need to stop talking. When, when I say taste, I I mean drink. <laughs> so, <laughs> swig it. Swig yeah, I got swig a little it. swig, swig, <laughs> So, uh, so we're drinking a wine called Valpolicella. Okay. Uh, so, in, may I inspect the bottle? Yeah. Valpolicella Ripasso. Yeah. Valpolicella. Classico Superiore. It makes me feel like it's a superior glass of wine. Superior. Yeah, and we and you know we can defend those words if you like. Um, but let's let's start with Valpolicella. So Valpolicella is a place, okay? In in the old world in Europe, they've been making wine so long, and they're so about that pride and authenticity that they say the place as opposed to the varietal. Whereas in America, we say this is a California Chardonnay right. or an Oregon Pinot. They just go, this is Valpolicella. Are there laws and, about and, that? And, and yes. So the Italian government, French government, most governments in Europe have an entire department that regulates wine. So and, I can't drink a Valpolicella if it's from Tuscany. Correct. Okay, but I can drink. If it's I from can Tuscany, drink a yeah. The noble grape of Tuscany is Sangiovese. Okay. And that's just like they bathe in that stuff down there. They love it. But like I know that if I'm drinking a super it's Tuscan, great. it's going to come from Tuscany. It is. A Super Tuscan's a little special because it's blended with uh, French grape varieties. I probably should have just said Tuscan. So usually, usually a, yeah. That's okay. So Valpolicella, it's a blend of three different grapes, okay? It's one of my favorite Italian wines. It, it really is that one where someone's like, I don't know what I want. I just want it to be delicious. I go, mm -hmm. got it. Valpolicella. Yep. Got it. <laughs> Do you trust me? Perfect. Well, we'll <laughs> right with, back with a glass. What kind of food would it go good with? Um, okay, so... What grows together goes together, what grows right? Together goes so, together. so in northern Italy, you've got beef. Okay, where down south, it's more like um, poultry and pork, right? Uh, at the farms up up north, it's more livestock. It's creamier cheeses. It's mushrooms. It's basil. It's pine nuts. Mm. Um, so you're talking creamier pastas. You're talking um, beef dishes with like roast potatoes and you know the hearty yeah a little bit heartier a little bit creamier um in the veneto uh specifically and around valpolicella you've also got uh it's it's coastal as well so you've got the alps on one side and you've got the coast on the other so this wine is ki kind of speaks to that because it's sort of like if you want to drink this with some seafood like some salmon or some halibut you can do that if you want if you want to do it with with a beef dish, you can do that too. You don't Roast usually chicken, pair perfectly. red wine with seafood, though. Usually, it's a white wine that has a lot of acidity, with like like a, a Pinot Grigio or yeah. a Sauv Blanc, right? Uh, or maybe a Sauv Blanc. I should. So there's sort of a if you look at it as a spectrum, right? Light bodied to full bodied whites and light bodied to full bodied reds. There's sort of a middle area right there, where it crosses over. So 
you may have noticed by now that I use some metaphors to explain things. It's just sort of like cool analogy. That, that just, helps. A yeah, dummy. I, I kind of think of it, like it's kind of how my Rain Man brain works. <laughs> that I helps guess. a dummy like me. Figure <laughs> I, that I out. have to kind of do it that way because it makes sense to me that way. And so um, when you're talking about pairing food, I like to think of two professional boxers getting into a boxing ring, right? And in professional boxing, there's featherweight, middleweight, and heavyweight, right? So and then you get all the bantam weight and it, well, but yes. yeah, I mean in general <laughs> let's keep it let's keep it nice and approachable. So featherweight, middleweight, heavyweight, um, same with food. Featherweight foods, light seafood appetizers, light salads, um, you know, light uh, white fish like like a halibut or like something some sort of uh, flaky sea bass or something like that. And then you start to move into your middleweights, which are more like salmon mm -hmm. or roast chicken. Or a sandwich. Would that be something uh, that's going to have like a higher that. fat content? Um, I bet you can. I bet you could make a couple correlations. Okay. For sure, and that, that kind of matches the weight, if you think about it too. Yeah. And then so so, if you think about pairing it with a white wine, you're at least making it so the body of your of your beverage meets the the body of the actual food you're eating, and then as you move into red wine those fattier components and stuff like that get counteracted by the tannins in red wine. Mm. So when you're talking about a salmon, it would be just as good with a light Oregon Pinot Noir that has a little minerality to it, right? Or like uh, there's an Italian varietal called Frappato, which if you're not drinking that stuff, put it on some ice. Frappato? Frappato, Frappato is what it's called. F-R-A-P-P-A-T. Frappato. 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 Uh, <laughs> and so... Yeah, man. I mean, big cranberry, big raspberry, super light. I mean, you can read right nice. through it. It's that it's so good. good. Yeah, it's one of those white wines that like you throw it in an ice bucket, man. I would have that by the pool all day, and I have I've, on occasion. I've been on a rosé kick. Hell yeah, rosé kick. Uh, yeah, Cote de Rose. Cote de Rose. Cote de Rose. De Rose. Okay. It. Uh, Kristen and I have been that. That's our go-to. It's at Sprouts, but the bottle in it of itself. I mean. At the very bottom, they they design a rose in the glass, Got and it. that um, that alone, I how was charming! Like, Ugh, that's you. Course. That's you to a T. You of have course. to you have to get your lady back. <laughs> does the show know uh, the lady? Does the show have the whole story on the lady and all the things? Your lady? Yes. Yeah. Yes, for the most part. Uh, one of the things that I don't know if everyone knows is that you're officiating my wedding. I do have the honor of being able to officiate your wedding. Yeah. Yeah. I'm and looking forward that's to a that. Huge. I mean, it's it's an honor. In and October of itself 2nd, for me right. because I've known you for years. Yeah. And I love you to death. And, you know, right it's, back it's at something you, What's that the official do? What's the, what's the job of the officiator? <laughs> <laughs> so do? that's it's, it's a good question because I, I didn't know what. Let I, me, I thought let I had me to go through like a Let me throw it at you. What do you think the job of the officiator? It it's, sounds it's like a referee it's, or something. It's, like it's, it's saying, official. It's, it is what it is no matter what you call it, but it, technically it's called an officiant. Efficient, for, yeah, with o an N. O F F. Efficient. I C E, I C I E N T. Efficient. Efficient. So you're officianting. Yeah. I am officiating. Officiating. Yes. Which I don't so know why they don't call it an officiator. Yeah. Officiator. Officiant. Yeah. A, a you googleizer. A you go <laughs> Oh, like I don't know what a you googly is. <laughs> uh, no. Okay. So th that's interesting because I don't think I've actually had a second. To think about it, I yeah. thought that was just uh, the person that's like, "You are married now." You that's kind of what I thought it was. You're too. not wrong. Yeah, that's kind of what I could literally is? stand up and is just that say that is? on October second, and it would make it legal. <laughs> no shit. For, yeah, take that to the bank. That makes my life easier. No. Do you? Bank, Great. Yeah. Do you? Great. <laughs> Open <laughs> bar. <snappy>. Great. <laughs> Anyway, this <laughs> wedding would be much better with wine. <laughs> better with wine. Yes, I'll have the wine with the rose at the bottom. Perfect. <laughs> Next thing you know, Kristen's just like sitting oh, there God. like Smeagol and shit. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, she's such a sweetheart, though. Seriously. And you, you, yeah. Nailed uh, it, buddy. I don't know what she's doing with you. Thank you. I have no, I have no fucking clue. With, hey, this relationship, <laughs> or, uh, in accordance to her, has probably been a lot better with wine. Yeah. Tell you that much. Cause totally. Because with my sporadic brain and being a, a psycho. It. Nah, I love you, bro. You're, you're, you're a little brother. You, you tell me what you think an efficient. All right. What, like what the role I, is. I think that the role of an officiant officiant <laughs> is yes to 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 marry the individuals and and have them both say i do but the role 
for someone who isn't of uh, a, isn't coming from a religious background or isn't coming from a religious um, party yeah. is to send off two individuals in front of a crowd in a way that is special to both individuals and to put into words something that the two individuals feel apart from what the individual sees. I, I think that judges. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think that plays. Yeah, I think Does that's that... that's a good answer. Because for while sure. you can I'll, see I'll, it. I'll join you in that. Little, <laughs> yeah, a little <laughs> golf clap on thank that you, Thank you. We'll for put sure. the snaps in sure. there. Puppy lost. <laughs> <laughs> you get off your ass and you find, find that, that fucking that... dog. <laughs> you got to think. You got a pet. You got a responsibility. <laughs> um, but I, I think I think in, in what you can visualize our relationship to be, yeah, you're not going to feel what our relationship is, but you can put into words just based off of what you see. And hopefully, if we pick the right person and, and the right person does what they do, how they do, mm -hmm. then they'll be able to vocalize it exactly how it's supposed to be said. Yeah. And we're not going to know what that looks like until the day of. Yeah. And, and, you know, all we've, we've talked about it. We're all going to sit down maybe with some wine, who knows? It'd be better. And it'd be way better, <laughs> dude. You know, um, after, that, after this we'll, point, it's we'll, gotta be a hashtag. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about some things that you guys want to do that like tailor it to you, but I think you nailed it. Um, from the first time I got asked to do that, it's always been an honor every time. And luckily I'm able to see those people grow up. Like I've, how old are you now? 24. You're 24. So I've known you since you were 17. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So let's, let's just go out on a limb and say there's been a lot of growth. You and I have had some adventures That's and, true. and I, I think I know you pretty well by now. And, and sh she's wonderful and she and I get along famously and I, and I, I know where she's coming from on it. And, you know, just like you said, it's about standing up. Hmm. If it's just two people. Um, whatever your fancy is. Yeah, whatever, right? man. Love is love. But I prefer four. I mean, sure. <laughs> so, you do look like a four or five type four of guy. <laughs> um, no, but it'd be interesting uh, to see how you handle that. <laughs> it's a lot of wow. time management. I would, I would, I would do some stretches Challenge before you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> better with wine. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, my philosophy has always been that it's defined by the two people that are in love, um, and and no matter what someone stands in front of you to and says, you'll continue to define it, uh, define it each day, each minute, each, each interaction, um, which is arguably the most beautiful thing in the world. And so um, I'm excited for you too. I appreciate that, Ryan. Yeah, Cheers. Absolutely. Cheers I'm indeed. super excited for that. And literally everyone in this room is going to be there that day as Hell well. Yeah. So you better hold up your Not if there's not a nacho <laughs> cheese fountain. <laughs> what? There better be a nacho cheese fountain or else I'm not coming. Okay, fair. We can probably we can probably work that in. Uh, Should have chocolate and nachos cheese, right sweet next to and each other. savory. Oh yeah, right next like to it. each other. Yeah. Um, no, it's so we haven't had that conversation yet uh, mm -hmm. between you, Kristen, and myself, and we haven't really gone over how that looks like in the speech and everything. And let me tell you how much my mother-in-law is freaking out about it, and how much I love it. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. Not because I, I like pushing her stress. That has nothing to do with it. Sure. But I've, everyone who knows me knows I do things sure. on on the, the drop of a dime. Like I, I, yeah. I'm a last minute person. Yeah. What is she it, freaking out about? The fact that we don't have a plan yet. Oh. Uh, we what? have a plan. We just no. don't. Yeah. It's not solidified. No. <laughs> I, I, op I, I opened up the door, so it's, it's game on at this point. Okay, game on. <laughs> so <laughs> I think some of your confidence comes from not only that you love 
that ass, that push and pull going on. But you you know that a moms love me. That's for damn sure. Moms love me. Look at that. Forehead. I can put them into a great wine. I got I got a forehead that goes all the way back <laughs> to my neck. I mean, look at this, look at this mug, nerdy mug. Um, no, I think I you know we'll have we'll make mom comfortable. She's gonna love it. We're butter up. What, what's beautiful butter for up. me though is uh, I chose obviously I, I asked you and chose you on purpose. And that's, that's good. The, that, 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 <laughs> I, did, yeah. I, I chose you <laughs> accidentally, Ryan. <laughs> what? <laughs> but that's the best part is because I, I know the beautiful things that you're able to do. Oh, that's nice. And so for them to be like, who did he choose? <laughs> I know who his friends are. Who did he choose? <laughs> that's the best part. Because when you deliver uh, a speech like I imagine you're going to, <laughs> and I can just sit back and be like. Yeah, that's what's up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. You know, Bain, that's, Bain would do that's great. where that. Bane would do great. Don't. Oh, Bane's gonna be phenomenal in the bridal uh, bridal party. <laughs> he best man. He's yeah. I have two best men. I you have, have two uh, best men. Eddie and Bane. Eddie and Bane. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um. Cool. So, yes. While they would do they would do great. I would yeah. be more concerned about them pulling up yeah. a slideshow of the shitty things we've done in the past couple of years. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I was curious to ask. I, I didn't want to ask this until we got a little bit more into the the, the wine endeavor. Um. But where is the wine world standing right now with COVID and everything else? I think it's important to inspect how closely tied the restaurant world is to the wine making community and the wine community um, in more ways than one. What do you mean by that? Meaning, meaning, yes, there are retail opportunities, but for a lot of independent winemakers, just like independent restaurant owners, it's a smaller batch thing that you're doing at a higher value level. And so when when those outlets for those smaller batch things become a non thing, right, all of a sudden you have to pivot, right? And so there are it's sort of a case by case basis, but like in in um, right now in uh, Bordeaux, they've made so much wine in Bordeaux they can't sell it, so they're working with how to how to work with the situation and. Right now, they're talking about banking it, like basically saying, you know, we're just going to wait for the market and we're basically going to put this vintage, a lot of it at least, in the vault. And, I'd be interested and then to see come how back that sells. a few years later because, you know, they'll ch- check it out. And Bordeaux specifically is very age worthy wine generally. Um, and so I love a good Bordeaux the, blend. Oh, it's it's amazing. And so you're talking about Cabernet, you're talking about Merlot, all and the a few, goods. all the goods exactly. And and a lot of the goods they have going on in there are that tannic structure, right? Because they're made with these grapes that have those those thicker grape skins and that and so, oak influence. Mm-hmm. Right, it's delicious. But those tannins actually help as a preservative. Like before people started pumping, I didn't know that. Yeah. So before people started pumping chemicals into into it, those heavier wines with more organic material in it, they would hold longer because those would act as natural preservatives. So that's why a, a Bordeaux is generally a very age-worthy wine. So that's an example of a, of a pocket of the winemaking industry that can pivot that way. So is it necessarily you know what I mean? a bad thing that they're holding on to and, and banking those wines because they're no. better aged anyway? It's not a bad thing at all. Um, I, I think they're doing it at such a scale that it that's something that you've never seen before. Like they, you know, all winemakers bank some of their wines to keep vintages, like just to see, you know, kind of half as an experiment just to see, well, what was this vintage like right. and what happened that year? How can we use that to sort of forecast what we're doing this year, et cetera, et cetera? And and oh, by the way, does the value of our wine go up? Because two years ago, that ninety seven was not drinking like that, and it is Fantastic. Because the flavor changes based on uh, the, the chemical structure in the bottle. Think about it like this. Let me try and say this exactly correctly. So we make a wine and we put it in this bottle. That means literally everything going on in that wine is happening in that bottle. Mm-hmm. Chemically, you're talking about the sugars, the acid level, the pH, the tannins, everything. It's all happening in that bottle and we let it sit for 10 years. What it's basically doing is settling right and it's all sitting in itself and basically the compounds in there are locking in and working together 
okay? Some are working not together and breaking it down, mm -hmm. but that's not always a bad thing if there's too much going on. So think about it like this. You make soup, and the soup is good, and then you put it in the fridge, and then you light it up the next day, right? You put it in a pan, and now everything that's been going on in that soup overnight, it all comes together and makes the soup taste better. Like tomorrow's soup usually is better than the night before, right? kind of the same thing winemakers already do that in the winery so they'll they'll blend the wine or or you know they'll they'll make a certain type of wine and they'll put it in a tank a, a steel tank to kind of all come together in the tank before they bottle it so that it can kind of pre-do that and then they'll put it in the bottle okay we've made our recipe it's ready to go we're going to put it in this container so it can all sit in there and age together. And each bottle has a life cycle, depending on the varietal, depending on, definitely depending on its storage and how, temperature and things like that. But like, a, in general, white wines age a little, there's, there's a less of a, an arc or a timeline on it. And red wines usually go out a little bit longer because of those things we talked about earlier. So. So you're trying to kind of work with those things. When you use the phrase open up, mm -hmm. now we've popped open the bottle. Oxygen is going in and oxidizing the wine um, or oxygenating, I think, is the word we're looking for. Okay. It's oxygenating the wine as opposed to oxidizing. Oxidizing okay. actually means that, that basically bad oxygen got in there at some point in the winemaking process and corrupted it a little bit. Mm. Or or aged it out a little bit. Sometimes it's interesting it's good. to think about uh, wine it, corruption. Yeah, it, <laughs> corrupt you know, if you've wine. ever <laughs> yeah. corrupt wine <laughs> like, is funky, dude. I, I think of the it's the, funky. It doesn't it, it doesn't hit you right. Remember wine. the whole better with wine thing? Not that wine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think of that as like the who's the Ronald McDonald uh, the, bur the burglar. Wine. Oh, I thought you were going to say, like, who, hey, the hamburger. hamburger. The hamburger. I, I, say, I think of it like the that, Ronald like, McDonald of wine. I was like, no. I'd like to plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think of it like that with, like, someone coming in and, and, and messing with a recipe, and it's like, what happened mm -hmm. to the wine? And the hamburger's like, hmm. You know, like, yeah. you can mess with the wine and, and right. kind of make it so that it's, it's while it's on the right track, one or two steps not sure in the, the, the process or the plan sure. can completely... Alter but, the taste, alter the, the everything about it. Right. And we're, we're talking about basically a little mutation that actually can turn into a style. Like anybody that's made a whiskey or a beer, like if you're around long enough, you will hear a story about, dude, we messed up in the distillery, but... Made it better. We made it better. Like it ended up being what we're known for, right? And so that's why a little bit of oxidization can be a really good thing. And actually when you're tasting wine and you're looking at a wine you can actually see some oxidiz oxidization because it shows up as a little bit of browning around around the glass. You can mm -hmm. usually see that that's gone on. It usually comes from oxygen getting into the barrels and things like that. And so I've seen that in older glasses of wine. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So older glasses of wine. You got your you got your son. I did. You did. I did. And and part of me doing that was because I did want to know and I I did want to educate myself. Yeah. Uh, and I wish that I have devoted or would have devoted more time in this past year to doing that. But I think that's kind of one of the reasons why I love having these conversations is because I know less than a half of percent of what we're talking about. Thank you, sir. Um, I know enough to get me by is probably a better way to put that. Um, but I, A, I'm never going to know it all. And B, the more that I can talk about it, and I'm sure you've felt the same way, the more that I can talk about it and the more that I can get that, no, you're, you're on the right path, makes me more confident in right. the knowledge that I have. So, right. yeah, I, I, I do have my level one. Can you call it that? An introdu introductory. Introductory. Is, yeah. Um, and so I know a little bit when I'm tasting, when I'm looking at wine, when I tilt the glass and, and everything else. Can, sure. I, can I draw ideas? 100%. Sure. I would, I would recommend anyone who even gives half a mind to... Oh, that seems like it would be interesting to go for the level one, the introductory, because it, yeah. it, it is so much information. It is it's so life changing. Yeah, it's still daunting. You it, look it really at it, tests and it you. you don't just take it with wine. You you taste food differently. You you mm -hmm. you think about pairings differently when you're, mm -hmm. you know, in laws are coming over or when your friends are coming over. You're like, well, what if what is this side yeah. dish? How is this going to complement? What are that? we going to eat? Today? Yeah, let me think about it. Yeah, right. And yeah. and you you definitely uh, see the 
culinary world yeah. a different way. Well, your palate's just like your brain or any other muscle. You have, you have to exercise it and think about what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? Like you do a crossword puzzle every morning, you're, you're probably a little more limber mentally, right, every day. Um, you go to the gym or every Sudoku. day and you work out. Yeah, <laughs> Sudoku, whatever it is, whatever. Hey, name your pleasure. But like either way, that's what it is. It's, it's honing your palate is the same as honing your ability to play an instrument or honing your ability to do a math or do algebra or whatever it is. People, as soon as you start to look at it that way, it becomes that way. Mm -hmm. So every time I taste something and every time someone hands me a cocktail or a wine or whatever and I pair them together, I kind of think about how those are playing together, you know? To go back to the the Psalm thing, I, I think it's, for me at least, it was like, uh, I have an end date where I'm going to take this test. Yeah. And you look at all of the information, and you're like, I don't know how the fuck I'm going to get all this in. <laughs> what would be the first steps that you would recommend someone who's of a beginner level who wants to do that and take that, that endeavor and, and, and make that a goal? First, I would say take a look at yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, no one knows everything about wine. No one. Like, no matter, no matter how how intimidating a master psalm is or, or someone like that. No one knows everything about wine. And so hopefully that takes a little bit of that, that weight off your shoulders so that you can at least start taking little bites. There's a saying that goes, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? That's kind of a gruesome phrase. <laughs> and so <laughs> my, per my, personal, my personal phrase is, how do you climb a big fucking mountain? One step at a time. Yeah, I know that. I've, I've gone on a few trips yes you have and done that and done that and it and it's like very daunting but if you just look at the step in front of you and then the next step right i want to get more used to bordeaux like i just want to know what people are talking about i hear things like left bank and right bank what is that right like start there start with things that you're you're actually interested in and then look at what the certification wants from you and if you take the dive at which i like you i suggest as many people do it as possible you get the course book and you study out of the course book and just take it a page at a time i think people are worried about the stigma of wine and and sommeliers and master sommeliers but if i'm being very honest don't get me wrong i'm sure there's a couple dickhead psalms out there but <laughs> for the most part just a couple any any master psalm or any any uh, certified sommelier they want they're lovely. people to to know about they're this lovely. and and they're very approachable they're very you know th they want to give all of that knowledge to someone because at the end of the day uh, i i, I don't want to put it this way but they're glorified they're getting paid to drink alcohol and they're very relatable people it's it's funny not when... get fucked up no i understand but even though that comes with the job i understand it's funny when you when you make something like that your profession. Um, and don't get me wrong, like we were, like you said, master psalms. I've never met more lovely and interesting people. Absolutely, ever ever. Like they're so wonderful and 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 in general, they are driven towards that hospitality aspect more mm -hmm. than they are anything else, because they know that there are a lot of egos at play when when you're talking about you know, this position and there should be like having an ego is part of your character, right? You, you know, I don't want a two by four coming up and talking to me about my wine. I want a human that like makes me laugh or intrigues me or gets me onto something new. Like I, I want that hospitalitarian to come up to me and, and kind of, you know, work me through it and, and or much like you do is put it into an, a, a perspective that makes sense. Like how you did the, the mixer thing with me that, clicked immediately yeah. you know well having yeah that actual person sure make a connection right right so the there i think th the groups that are giving out the certifications um and and holding people accountable to to the knowledge they're they do such a great job of making sure that the focus is taking care of people mm -hmm. and it really yes it, it is so fun to 
know these things and and be able to wow people with a great dining experience and a great wine, get them into these things. But at the end of the day, it's about making people feel at home and comfortable when they're out on a date or right. celebrating an anniversary or just out with some friends or catching up or whatever it is. The whole idea is to facilitate a good time and be pleasant and nice and efficient. Like that's, that's all it is. Well, and what's the worst thing that comes from having a little bit of knowledge about wine? You Shit, I'm still trying to find out. Phenomenal <laughs> I'm wine. still trying to find out what the worst thing about it yeah. is. I really can't. <laughs> yeah. I, so, so you go out with yeah. a whole bunch of friends and, and you have a little bit of knowledge of wine. You're like, you know what? If this is what we're doing tonight, I recommend this wine. Yeah. What's the worst? Someone's going to look at you and be like, oh, this wine is great, and I'm so glad that you thought of it. <laughs> no, that's it, never going to happen. It's fortunate when that happens. In, gen uh, in general, uh, I usually don't do that unless someone asks me to. Mm -hmm. Like, But you go out with the same group of people or whatever, and there are certain groups that are like, Ryan, you're going to pick the wine, right? Or there are certain groups where it's like, Ty, you should pick the, ri the wine tonight. Or... Grant, do you have a wine that you like? <laughs> yeah, I don't <laughs> think people relate about. wine knowledge to it's all about having a good time. Exactly. Because when you like the movie Psalm, yeah. which is intense. It's super intense. So intense. And not, and not so, to say that they're doing things yeah. that people shouldn't be doing. They're, they're, no they're studying their it's, asses It's something off. to aspire to. Absolutely. Absolutely. But when someone watches something like that, and it's so intense, and oh. it's so uh, practiced oriented and it's so uh study forward you it know, could turn someone off but at the end of the day right they all came from the same spot of loving the beverage that's in our glass right now totally and i think you can say that about anything like i mean for me to sit there and go like i would like to learn quantum physics <laughs> you know what i mean like you Sweet can God. you can start off with that and be like dude i, I just think black holes are cool i'll and put I you think, in touch I think with the our idea guitarist, of time space is cool <laughs> But once you dive a little deeper, you start to see people are like, no, my profession is that I, I figure out times like space time. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> like that's like, what no, I do. No. I, th we are actually on the cusp of figuring out X, Y, and Z. And the only reason is because there are people like so-and-so that, that I look up to and, and I myself are, am trying to push the boundaries of figuring out space time. Right. So it's the same with wine. You can you can enjoy it at different levels, or you can make it academic at different levels, and it's all about like what you want to do with it. If you if you want to do it, if you want to do it so that you're the coolest guy or girl that shows up to the party, and everyone's looking forward to whatever bottle you bring, that's rad. If you want to do it because you want to figure out why the climate in South Africa makes the grapes that they grow down there different than the ones that they grow in New Zealand or the ones they grow in Oregon, you can do that too. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with any of it. What is the future for Ryan Gardner and wine? Is that Would you ever aspire to make your own wine? Would you ever aspire to uh, start your own line? That's a good question. I, I, I would love to be, well, I, I think I'd have to go to the step of being a fly on the wall uh, while watching someone make wine. I've seen certain steps of the process, but I'd like to see it all the way through from right. from grape to glass. And um, I'd be interested in it if, if for nothing else than to like play around with a bunch of different, you know, Pinot Noirs or Cabernets yeah, in order to kind of mix and match and be like, cool, like, how do you build a salad? Like, what kind of <laughs> salad do you like? Because <laughs> I want my salad to be kind of like this. And... You, you know, to be able to put your stamp or your signature on something like that, I think would be totally rad. Um, is it the aim of what I'm doing? No. Like, I, right what now. What is the aim? The aim is to uh, honestly. <laughs> so, the aim is to think back to when I first started in restaurants and look at all the people that, have ha that are having their first day or their first week or their first month where they look at the hospitality industry and they just want to get better and they hope that there's a resource out there that they they aren't intimidated by that is approachable and accessible and doesn't make you feel weird about having a question about thing things um so my hope is to continue down that line 
um, and and bring more people into the fold with that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I've, I've had the good fortune to meet and hang out with a few winemakers in their vineyards, you know, like crack a beer after trying some of their wines. And Is that and blasphemous? What's that? Is that blasphemous? Hell no, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were one of my favorite quotes of, of these interviews. Um, uh, Justin Willett said it from Tyler Weiner. He said it takes a lot of beer and coffee to make wine. And I'll tell you right now, I, I don't know many winemakers that don't have a kegerator in their <laughs> oh, that's in gnarly. their in their winery yeah. because it's like when you're when you're drinking Pinot Noir or Cabernet or Syrah all day. Because you have to, right? Right. I mean, you have to. Have to. But you do because that's uh, what, what, a, that's what, what a, you have to do. You have to taste how it's thing. coming out. So n- even if you're spitting it out, like y- you know, after <laughs> 14 tastes, like you're getting beer. buzzy, and you're sort of like, man, my palate's fried from this red wine. I need like a Modelo. Like I need a crisp Mexican beer yeah. just to like clear <laughs> me out, get me ready, um, and so. As much as I possibly can. I want to drive people to your website because I feel very strongly in your capability to teach multiples of people, not just, you know, the the one person that wants to learn something. You work phenomenally with a group because as soon as that, that light bulb hits one person, they ask the right question. And then as soon as they see that person ask the right question, another person ask the right question. Not to say that there's any wrong questions, but you 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 see when the light bulb goes on. Yeah. Right? You see nice when they get say. it. I, I, I hope that's what it is. All the best learning environments that I've ever been in have been something where it's not just someone kind of like barking at you for an hour right. or barking at you, you know? Like, I mean, you've been to one of my wine meetings. Yeah. It's hands not, on. I, I try. I try not to make it something where it's just you know that Charlie yeah. Brown wah, super wah, chill. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, and it's chill. It's like this. This is supposed to be about enjoying one of the finest things made on the planet Earth for literally thousands of years. One okay, of the finest things. Made I want to fight you on that real quick. I want <laughs> to fight say you. that. I want to fight you on that real quick. It's not one of the No, 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 because I I, I read a book. He has to say, right? Wine's not that great. (laughs) No, I love wine. I do. I love wine. But but, uh, because I'm a jackass, uh, I read a book. uh, I want to say it's The World of Beer. um, And I... I, our buddy read that. Our buddy Matt Snap gave it to me like... Yeah, it's a great book. Four years ago, three years ago. And I just finished it like six months ago. It's a big book. If I remember correctly, it's like it is. It's, it's thick. It's, it's thick. It's, it's, a, it's a big book. Two seats, book. but I, <laughs> I she thick that book. Could she could thick. I have finished it sooner? Yes, but sure. One of the interesting things it brought up in that book, and I I love beer. Like any every, the the production of it, the store, the history of it, uh, how it's been made and tailored to to different occasions and to different uh, regions, much like wine. Hell yeah, beer's delicious. But I feel like there's a perpetual war between beer and wine. And I only say that because beer was made first and mm-hmm. wine was made second and wine was marketed as something that's classier than beer. You're not entirely wrong. And that has to do with a sp- not, I'm not getting political, Oh but, boy. but <laughs> not, not much has changed in a lot of respects, but especially back in the day, the people that were the haves were the haves, mm-hmm. and the people that were the have-nots were the have-nots. And you mean royalty? Yes, I mean like straight up royalty, and there was no middle class. Mm-hmm. It was like you are here or you are here, right? And so, by by hook or by crook, the people in in the aristocracy would either own the land that wine was made on. And marketed it to themselves okay. and to everybody in order to keep the landed gentry from thinking that they were on the same level. Mm-hmm. And that makes sense because beer was able to be made by yeah. anybody and everybody. I mean, pretty much. Any anybody that had a wheat field could make could beer. probably make beer. And it was right? safer than the water they were drinking Correct. back then. And and that's where a lot of this came from before there was aristocracy or not aristocracy. A lot of that came from like Dude, our water is gross. Right. (laughs) Like, let's mix it with some wine because the alcohol in the wine or the alcohol in the beer will make it kill everything. It'll make it, it will kill all the bacteria. Yeah. So we'll be okay. And so 
It wasn't until much later that it became a thing. Now, that being said, let's, let's all fly back to Italy real quick. Will you come with me to Italy? Yes. No, 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 North no, or no. south? No, Italy sounds awful. <laughs> uh, so do you want a little white wine, by the way? A little what? Clear your palate a little bit for your next glass of red wine. So we had a little bit of a wine-induced technical difficulty, but we are back, and we have our white wine. <laughs> indeed we are. Hey indeed we do. Uh, what do we have here? So we went back to the, the Suave real quick. Suave. Uh, great, great. Sorry. <laughs> suave. Uh, no, we went back to the Suave because it's a great palate cleanser. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, I, I think we got into a little bit of a conversation uh, about it. Uh, Real quick, on, are you cleansing our palate because you have something else in store? We can. I have I have a, a, a surprise bottle. I would just need to open it up right now, and then we would need to let it breathe for a while. Okay, we can make that happen. Okay. I was just wondering because this almost kind of seems of of uh, like a teaser. Well, we're gonna cleanse our well, palate. Well, the room got a little warm. Yes, it did. As as it does in the middle of hell. That's uh, the truth. <laughs> literal hell. Right. Oh, what are we in August now? August. Yeah. August. Yeah. <laughs> what What year is this? August. Um, the one that should not be named. <laughs> that's right. That's why we call it August. <laughs> so it's very hot, and yeah. I thought that it would be nice to go back to a nice, cool palate cleansing white wine um, before we keep going down the red wine road. Um, and much like you're probably seeing already, our mood is a little bit lifted. We feel a little bit more refreshed. A little um, fuzzy. Well, f- fuzzy in a good fine. way, in a good way, yeah, in a warm way, fine. you know. Um, so, so yeah, so I'm gonna pop open some Barbera for us. Barbera, uh, I've, I've I've had this bottle of wine before, not this particular bottle, but I've had this wine before, and it just needs some time to breathe. Honestly, yeah, it needs about a half an hour. Well, I think Damn. we can. I think we can manage that. Yeah. Um. So, I, to, if I'm being honest, I went into this podcast. Both of us did, knowing that this was probably gonna be. One of those longer ones. So, um, <laughs> in a good way. Oh, in a very good way. <laughs> in a very good way. Yeah. You and I, here. You, we can talk for hours. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I just want to talk about something that uh, your Arizona comment made my brain go. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. Who the fuck decided Arizona was going to be a great spot for Phoenix? You know, like um, I, I, they I must have only... came here at the wrong part of the, at yeah. the best part of the year. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. then when summer hit, they're like, what the fuck did we get ourselves into? It's funny you say that because I've often thought about that where they probably came here in the like five months where it's just honestly the best weather <laughs> yeah. you can ask they're for like, Hell yeah. on the planet. They're like, dude, is this the place? Mm-hmm. I think we should make this our place. And 70 degrees? Yeah. Fuck yeah. End of May rolls around and they're just like, the fuck? <laughs> you know, it, it got a little. You still thinking this is a good place? It, let's just write They're it out. Like, yeah, let's, let's write, write it out. out. They're like seven people have died. <laughs> <laughs> you know we're running out of water, right? Yeah, but there's that there's that river. There's like, that river yeah. over there. You want to go there right now? Right, but no, there I was mean, a river. You got you gotta <laughs> you gotta hand it to human ingenuity and and survival because they said, well, we're gonna create something called the Salt River Project, mm-hmm. and the Salt River Project was. Let's dam up some of these um, northern Arizona and eastern Arizona rivers, right? The Salt River, and basically turn them into lakes, and we'll build dams, and and we'll be able to control the irrigation of this valley that we love to live in. Right. So that, I mean, that was basically how. Would you consider that a damn good project? You uh, do. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. <laughs> he did. Oh. This was a lot of fun. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm just gonna. Yeah. <laughs> Definition of drops, Mike. Uh, I may see you at the wedding. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, re- let's reconsider that. Uh, you and Chris and I are gonna have to <laughs> sit down and <laughs> renegotiate. I hope you guys know a really good priest. Uh, uh, talk to the stepmom. Oh boy. So. Oh boy. Okay. So. Oh. Oh, that's not good. Talk oh, about no. technical difficulties. Oh, oh, no. All right. <laughs> Better with wine. <laughs> uh, okay, let's talk about your current line of work and when everything happened with the shutdown. And I mean, everyone in the service industry was displaced. First of all, the, the thoughts in our group immediately were make sure our people are taken care of. Mm-hmm. And, and I when, can't when you say the thoughts group. immediately, that was when shutdown happened. Correct. That, that's early March. Correct. 
And when you say the the, the group, you mean I mean Fox Restaurant Concepts, right? And yeah. and the, the the people that run the business. Mm-hmm. So from Sam Sam Fox himself all the way down in 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 the leadership of the company, everyone was just how do we take care of our people? Mm-hmm. That's it. So we we did unfortunately have to furlough a large number of people, much like several other groups and or independent places had to do. Um, we had to shut down certain places um, strategically in order to mitigate, you know, kind of what was going on. Um, but the reason that it happened so soon, the reason that as soon as shutdown happened, it was like furlough everybody. Right. There was a genuine reason behind that. hundred percent. hundred percent. And that speaks to their it mission was, statement of great hospitality every time you take care of your people regardless exactly. of what's going on. And, and it was hard to furlough people, but it, and in the beginning I was just like, wow, what is going on? We're, we're shit. We all were. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was like, we're asking these people to get off the ship. But when you think about it from a leadership standpoint, it's, we need to furlough these people as quickly as possible because that gives them the, the first place in line for their unemployment. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's going to get better, but, or it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so by furloughing people, it, it put them immediately in the front of the line to get taken care of. And then we immediately set up a GoFundMe, uh, a couple of other relief funds, and then also made it to where the people remaining in the restaurants, which were basically management staff, so full restaurants that were working with staffs that were 60 to 80 people strong, were now down to eight people. Mm-hmm. And those places were converted into to-go which a lot of us experienced on one side or the other. Right. And so now you're looking at large platform storefronts that were dine-in service that now we needed to reconfigure with not even skeletal scat the staffs. Like you're, you're talking about people, you're talking about just bare bones staffs that need to operate and be able to pivot and turn some sort of profit so that we can keep these relief funds going for all the people that got furloughed. And that, it, it was so inspiring to see that pivot. Um, the beverage department, in, uh, specifically, we, we got the, the kind of collar taken off of us for uh, to-go cocktails, right? So we immediately shift into this place where, okay, what do to-go cocktails look like, right? And so it started to become this I mean, the, the Henry Test Kitchen became the, the Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory of to-go cocktails. Yeah. And so it shifted into this, how, how do we still provide the, the services and, and the awesome items that we're able to provide in this weird time? And it, not only was it weird in general, but I mean, we were all there. I mean, day to day, the landscape was changing. Mm-hmm. Day to day, it was like, do we get to do, do we get to do to go cocktails tomorrow? <laughs> we don't know, and so it was just about shifting uh, our our mindset and starting to think about things uh, a little differently. And how does that look in now? We're operating, uh, and we have since the beginning at a fifty percent or less uh, occupancy on any given night. So restaurants that were doing on a Friday night seven hundred. And fifty to nine hundred covers are now down to like two fifty. On purpose, right? We're we're like when when we open things back up, um, Sam Fox and our and our higher leadership team really made it a point to hopefully because we want to remain a, a leader uh, in the industry, make some of our own standards even before our governor came out and said, you need to be 50% occupancy or lower. We just started doing that. Like, it was like, we, our entire philosophy was slow and safe. We don't need, we still got to go going. There's no reason to, to try and push any of this. Um, and again, just really impressed how it, it wasn't about any sort of sales driven mantra it literally was we just want to make sure people feel safe Mm -hmm. coming into our restaurants our employees and our guests i think uh going through something like that really put businesses uh whether it's a small business or a large business um 
to the test of reality. Yeah. And hey, anything can happen on the drop of a dime. Anything can happen. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for it? Yeah. For myself personally, it it put into perspective of the things that I love and the things that I want to devote time to. Yeah. Um, when everything was shut down, and I'm I'm still going to work, I'm thinking, okay, well, what? How can I best spend my time? knowing that there's something out there that is hurting people. Um, if for some reason my family was affected by this, what would be the best thing that I can do to make those last couple moments sweet? You know, how can yeah. I, how can I do that? And that's just devoting time. And yeah. it sounds so easy, but it's not, it's not that easy. Yeah. Just devoting time. I think a lot of people have awakened themselves to that. Yeah. That idea of I just want to spend time with the people that I love and the people that that inspire me and the people that I've come up with. I hope so. I hope I hope people remember that uh, moving forward. I hope that, you know, everyone that's been forced to work at home and take care of their kids remembers that they do love spending time. Yeah, <laughs> with, uh, that's true. you know what I, you know what I mean. But but you're not wrong. I think I think that especially in those first couple months it really put a lot of things in perspective for a lot mm. of people. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, well, Grant, you, you were directly affected by this in a different way that him and I were. Well, I appreciated the, um, the opportunity to be ahead of the curve. Like you were saying, we were able to get unemployment benefits quick. So but it's important to know all aspects and all perspectives, like for real. Yeah, I mean, and, and then it goes back to what Ty said. I mean, it just gives me more time to kind of do what I want to do, you know? Yeah. So I mean, we've grown like exponentially very, just in, in our music and, and yeah. in doing this podcast because we've had the time to do that. You guys are doing music? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're in a band. Yeah. I didn't know that you were in a band together. Yeah. I knew that you were part of a band i didn't know you were too that's definitely bittersweet like sure you would like to have a steady job and whatnot but sure you know things change and you gotta adapt it's interesting especially when you're making something creative like music um the circumstances that bring a group of people together and how that can whether consciously or subconsciously affect the, the art coming out of it so For what it's worth, your mindsets right now, what the world is right now, and how that's all coming out on the other side, it's all together. Like you, everybody's got to be somewhere, and we're here. I think it's it's interesting because while while there's so many people out of work, I almost think that it's made people want to work harder. Yeah, because they don't have that now. Everyone wants a vacation, but nobody wants to not have a job. Yeah. Everyone wants to have time off, but nobody wants to have a permanent time off. Right. And so him and I being able to find something like this and like our band has only made us want to be like, fuck everything else. I want to work on this. Yeah. And I want to put all of my time and effort into this because if if I can do this, essentially, uh, it's something I love and it doesn't feel like I'm being forced. Right. Well, and it's you a know. passion project, so your your mind is getting taken off of everything going on, and you can pour your whole self into that, and you can you can have a, a ready resource for that drive to do it because you're like, I don't have all these other things that are pulling my attention, and also I need to just keep my mind off of what's going on. Right? Yeah. You know, I need I need to keep my mind sure. active and nimble. Like I need to I need to have something. Um, and, you know, it's not easy on any side of this. It's, it's just not easy no. on any side of it. We're all new. Yeah, it's, it's hills, valleys, and plateaus. Yeah. You come in one day from, from the next, and some days you're like, you know, I got it. We're good. Like, I'm, gonna, I'm not, like, great, but I can, we can have a day. We can, we can do the thing. Other days, it's, it's a little tougher. And that's the weirdest part. I feel like everyone has, has experienced that, that, that yeah, everyone. And I, I, I go back to what Matt Thornton said when it's like, it's fine. Mm-hmm. That's literally how he said it. And I was looking at, it, I'm like, how do you say it that way? But he's not wrong. It's no. fine. It's fine. And maybe, and maybe that's how he's processing it. And some people may look back at him just like, obviously it had an impact on you when he said that, 
you can look back at them and go, you know what, maybe it is, maybe it just needs to be fine. Because that is one big thing out of all of this is the realization that a lot of people have had that they, they don't have as much control as they think they have. And again, I'm not saying that to dive down a rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. What I'm saying is, I mean, we can go there if you want. But. Right. But I'd rather not <laughs> because that's not what I meant by it. I, I right. didn't, I didn't mean by it. I hope you take it as, you know, we need to treat each moment like we can control what we're doing with our understanding or our patience or our empathy or that de-escalation part of a situation. I think something that I've, I've history repeats itself. And when you talk about diving down the rabbit hole, while we won't do that, uh, <laughs> obviously people have had a lot of time mm -hmm. on their hands. Mm -hmm. And even people that have been working have had a lot of time on their hands. I'm no different. I'm, I'm, researching you know 1918 spanish flu i'm researching bubonic plague and you know what comes out of every pandemic a renaissance era absolutely every single pandemic mm -hmm. a couple years of creativity a couple years of art a couple years of something new yeah whether that's because people are tired of being locked down which is probably a huge part of it sure but also because they re they they reinvent themselves and they they look at the world and they say I don't have that much time. Right. Now I've since I was fourteen fifteen I've always done the music thing and anyone I talk to they're like dude you you have time you're only this this many years old I'm like no you don't get it yeah I don't have time and it with this whole pandemic it, it really I've always thought of myself as like you know. Okay, maybe you're too neurotic. Maybe you're just trying to get it out, you know. And this pandemic just kind of like gave me the thumbs up. Like, no, no, no. Keep having that same mentality. Well, fear is a powerful thing. The, the fear of not leaving your mark or leaving a legacy or achieving or producing, that can, that can be a powerful motivator, right? It's not the only way to live your life, and it's certainly not an easy way to live your life, but... It can be a powerful motivator. Going back to what you were saying about a renaissance usually coming out of destruction or a turbulent time, um, I equate it back to a, kind of a natural order of things, which the word the word is entropy, right? So things get destroyed, or whether it's an ideology, or you know, or a building, or a forest, like a forest goes through a fire and all the trees get burnt down to embers, but all those embers are nutrient rich and go into the soil. And if you hike through a forest that burned down three years ago, it will have new, lots of beautiful new growth she coming did. out of it. And it, she did, <laughs> she, she did, did, but she going to live again. She Two did. And them trees are going to be thick. <laughs> 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 no, but it's true. And so, so it's all a process. I'm not saying that, you know, all those negative aspects are great and we should like try to have that happen, but it is sort of a process. And like you said, hopefully it has humanity come back with a better appreciation, a more creative and, and uh, collective idea of how to go about life. Um, and we'll all meet at a dinner table with some wine and some good food, and some great conversation. That's right. Because to me, that is how you make that it can change the world. Uh, Ryan, I appreciate how much uh, just having you on and, and picking your brain and talking to you about everything and everything, uh, anything and everything, because it it gives me a different perspective each and every time. You know, we've had great conversations we've had even better conversations and then we've had the real conversations <laughs> and uh it just seems like every time that i talk to you it, it, i learn something new thanks for um, having me i want to have you back on cool so I'm hopefully down. uh hopefully 
once we release this podcast, it doesn't do too many things to your reputation. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're like, he did acting. Yeah. Uh, oh, who is no. this guy? <laughs> and why didn't he tell me this? Oh no, <laughs> no um, I can't. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, Ty. And I, I, I love what you guys are doing. It's awesome. Um, I'm so glad to be able to catch up with you, especially during a weird time like this. And and I mean, at least pop some bottles and 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 chat. Makes it better. It, makes it, it better. really does. Wine makes it better. It really does. Cheers. Cheers, indeed. So. Get in. Ah, oh, no, that's that's bad luck. It's a, come, you know, here, you. So. <laughs> hey, come here, you. Come here, you. Don't know you go over there with your smile and All right. That's wine talk right there. Yeah. You uh, cheers, gents. Count it. Ooh, I'm getting hints of grapes. <laughs> <laughs> For everyone listening, please flood ryanswines.com <laughs> with all of the love and all of the uh, wanted knowledge because that's where you're going to find it. Uh, real quick, www.ryans-wines. Ryans-wines.com. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put a little link in there, too. Appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.